had just moved out of a share house in the suburbs and into my own shitty one-bedroom apartment in the city. I'm a male, and at the time I was around 25 years old. My apartment, while old and small, was located about 500 meters from one of the most popular night spots in the inner city. As I was in my mid-twenties and out on my own, this was pretty much the perfect place for me. This was because my friends and I were quite social, and would frequent bars and nightclubs in the city. The taxi fares were starting to add up. Also, this new apartment was close to my work, so it made the most sense. I got settled in right away, and invited my friends over for pre-drinks before hitting the clubs. Due to the limited space in the apartment, this meant that some friends were inside and some were drinking in the walkway just out front. We had the music up, and had just started drinking, but between songs, I could hear the couple next door arguing. Now, the apartment was old and shitty, which meant thin walls too, so I pressed an ear to the wall in order to listen in. I hadn't met any of my new neighbors at this time as I didn't take long to move in and I didn't really see anyone during the moving. I was a bit curious. Judging from what I could determine while eavesdropping, there were a gay couple in their early thirties. One of the men was yelling at the other to go next door and tell us to keep it down. The other was arguing that it was just a housewarming party and to let it go for the night. Since I didn't want to cause any trouble, I marshaled everyone outside to start making our way to the nightclubs, leaving my new neighbors alone in peace. Later that night, I came home alone, as I was tired from the move. I decided to let my friends carry on partying without me. I arrived at my door and proceeded to fumble around for my keys, when I looked up to see a man standing on the walkway in front of the next apartment, smoking a cigarette. He was tall and thin, with brown, oily hair. I noticed he also had a cut lip and a faded but visible black eye. I said, Good day. Sorry about the noise earlier, correctly assuming that this was my neighbor. He replied, Nah, you're all right, mate. I'm Chris. He shook my hand. I noticed his knuckles were red and a little bit scratched up so I knew something was off. I apologized for the noise again and said, I hope I didn't cause any trouble for you. He withdrew his hand with a soft cracking voice and said, Nah, that's okay. Rick just gets a bit cranky sometimes. I'm, I'm used to it. With that, I finished off the conversation and told Chris that I'd see him later. It was about 2 a.m. at this point and I just wanted to sleep, but I couldn't help worrying about the potential domestic abuse going on next door. I decided I'd keep an eye on it for now, as I didn't have all the info. For all I knew, he could have gotten into a fight with someone else. As the weeks passed, though, I noticed my new neighbors got drunk regularly and would argue almost all the time. I could tell Rick was the dominant one, as his voice was a lot deeper and Chris seemed to be afraid of him during their shouting matches. This is why I kept my distance and never really tried to socialize with them. I would even overhear them arguing about me and how Rick thought that Chris liked me. I would just tune all of this out with headphones and video games, not to mention an active social life and full-time work to keep me occupied. I did find myself having to avoid having guests over because of the neighbors. I would opt to meet people out as their arguments could be quite upsetting. And this was working out fine enough for a while, until Christmas that same year. I was arriving home after having come from last minute Christmas shopping. I was getting ready for a night of present wrapping, as I was to visit my family the following day for Christmas. As I arrived home though, I noticed two police cars outside and Anna, an Asian woman who lived a few apartments up from Chris, was screaming. I asked her what was happening, but all she could say was, it's just so sad, while sobbing. I could see three officers trying to restrain somebody, 
and there was blood on their uniforms. I came just a bit closer to see Chris's oily brown hair in the center of the affray. His face was bleeding from his jaw, where he had apparently been slashed by something sharp. They got him to his feet, and I could see that his cheek had been cut so deep that the skin was flapping open as he struggled and resisted with the police. I recoiled in shock and went to comfort Anna, who was crying uncontrollably at this point. Suddenly, Rick's voice boomed out from nowhere. You see what you've done? You fucking loser. Just kill yourself. This frightened me, and my instinct was to get myself and Anna to safety. Even though the cops were here, they had their hands full with Chris, and I certainly didn't want to get involved with such an ugly fight where knives were involved. Anna refused to come with me, and said that she would be fine. I looked around to see where Rick was, as he kept yelling at Chris the whole time the three cops struggled to restrain him. I could hear Chris whimpering apologetically in between. I couldn't see where Rick was, so I decided to just go to my apartment and lock the door. As I turned to go, I froze in horror as Rick's voice boomed. Where the fuck are you going? A deep chill went down my spine as my brain struggled to reconcile the fact that these words were coming out of Chris's mouth. I felt panic grip me as I realized that this whole time Rick and Chris had been the same person. All the fighting, laughing, drinking, and carry on that I couldn't help overhearing over the last couple of months had come from one solitary person. A lonely man in his small one-bedroom apartment. For some reason, this made me feel sick and uneasy. I learned later from Anna that this wasn't the first time the police had come to take Chris away. Anna explained that he spends a few months at the local psychiatric hospital each time. His father owns the apartment, so it's here waiting for him whenever he gets out. I moved out a few months later, and while it's a sad situation for Chris, and I really do feel for him, Let's never meet again. I'm 18 years old. After a particularly bad breakup, I decided that I might as well try my hand at plenty of fish. My mom had met her boyfriend from there, and he seemed pretty nice, so I figured why not. I set up a profile, and within a few days, I had a few people messaging me, but nothing was really working out. Then this guy messaged me, named Josh. Josh was really attentive and really sweet, and he asked me really engaging questions about a few things on my profile, like why I liked singing so much and what I thought about some issues going on in the news recently. It was refreshing amid the many questions of... If I've ever known a real man, or was I into this particular thing, or wanted to hook up. After talking to him for about a week, I decided that maybe it would be nice if we met in person, so we arranged to meet at a store near my house. I used to work there, so it's really no big deal to me, and I don't have a car, so I just walked. He looked like his profile, so nothing seemed really weird. He was very sweet and opened the car door for me, and we went down to the creek. Now, I live in the southern United States, in a small town, so basically the only thing to do here is go swimming, drive around, or go to a slightly bigger town and mess around over there. I just thought of sitting down at the creek would be nice. After all, it was something that we did both enjoy. Sadly, the creek near my house was very shallow due to a rainstorm that came through and brushed up a lot of sand from the bank into the water, so we decided to go to a different creek that he said was deeper, about 15 minutes away from my house. No big deal. Josh told me that a friend of his named Nick was supposed to be there with his girlfriend, but when we got there, there were no other cars. I was apprehensive, and I guess he saw it on my face and called his friend. Nick said they'd be coming shortly, and there was nothing to worry about, but they were okay and it was fine. Nick never showed up. The date was alright, mostly. 
We talked about basic things like what we enjoy about each other's personality and what it would turn into if we went that far. I got a red flag as we were getting out of the water. He asked me over and over and over again if after this date I was going to be his girlfriend. This was only our first date, and I'm not that type of person. I don't really trust people, so me being alone with this guy was a big stretch in and of itself. I told him at first, after the date is over I'll give you an answer, but he just kept pushing me. I didn't say anything after that, I just ignored him. We put on our clothes and got back into the car. He handed me a shirt to throw on since mine was a little thin. We decided to go to the park. On the way though, he just kept asking me over and over and over if I was going to be his girlfriend, that he really liked me and wanted it to work out. I told him again that after the date I was going to give him an answer. I usually text my mother where I was whenever I went off with someone. I always do. I texted my mom and told her that I felt kind of weird about Josh, but she said it was probably just the jitters. I trusted my mom, so I brushed it off and went to the park anyway. When we were there, he just kept asking, Will you be my girlfriend? Over and over. Eventually I got sick of him asking, so I said, Fine. I didn't really want to. I felt weird, but I still said yes. I definitely shouldn't have done that. That was probably the biggest mistake I made. After that, we went to go see Jurassic World, which was playing in another town about 10 minutes away from there. After talking to my mom, making sure it was okay that I stay out a little later than planned, we headed that way. The movie was nice, but Josh wasn't. At the movies, he started getting really touchy-feely, trying to constantly hold my hand or play with my hair or get me to sit in his lap. Normally, I like those things because it's a sign of affection, but with him, it was really weird, and there was something just off about it. I asked him to stop and even swatted his hand away a couple of times. When we were driving back home, I got a text from my ex. It wasn't anything bad, just him asking where I'd been and if I was okay. We were still okay, I guess. We weren't exactly the best of friends, but we weren't enemies either. He would just pop in to check on me from time to time and make sure I was alright, and I would do the same for him. No big deal. But when Josh saw the text, he went off. I told him it was my ex and that we were still cool, but there was nothing to worry about. It turned into something I definitely needed to worry about. This was when Josh proceeded to tell me that his brother is the higher up of a gang here in the state I live. That weirded me out. But people lied about that something before, so I didn't really take it seriously. And that's when he started threatening me. He took my phone away from me in the car. Mind you, and while driving, proceeded to go to my Facebook and change my profile picture and put in a relationship. I asked him what the hell he was doing, but he wouldn't let me see my phone. I was pissed, but something told me not to go off, so I didn't. Instead, I waited until he was done and texted my ex to just leave me alone. He said okay, and that was it. I was done talking to him, and it was just me and Josh in the car. That's when Josh proceeded to threaten to slit my ex's and little sister's throat in front of me if I ever spoke to him again. What really got me is that I'd never told him that my ex had a sister, and he named her by name. I was freaked out, but I couldn't really do anything. I was still stuck in the car with this guy. I really wanted to leave, but I didn't have a way out, so I just waited until he took me home. He ended up talking to my parents and staying until almost 4 a.m. I wanted to go to sleep, but whenever I tried, he would try to make me lay on him. I didn't want to, but if I moved, he would pick up my head and just move me right back. So I stopped, pretended to be asleep, and waited until he left to give me a kiss on the forehead. The next day was my brother's birthday, and my mom had invited him over, so I waited until he came to the house before the party started. I called him to remind him that the party was happening. He was talking about how a few friends of his had gotten word of who my ex was and where he lived. He started cussing under his breath in Russian. I don't speak Russian, but I know cursing when I hear it. When he got to the house, he told me that the people he knew could handle him, me, and my ex. 
I told him it wasn't necessary and to cut it out. I told him that one thing he was never supposed to do was threaten me, and that I didn't feel safe and he needed to leave. He begged me to stay, begged me to give him a second chance, but I wasn't giving up. Something about it just rubbed me the wrong way. Normally I do give people second chances, but not this time. He pulled out his wallet to grab something from inside it. I believe it was his lighter, and I saw his ID. His profile said he was 22, but the birth year was wrong. If he was only 22, then he should have been born in the year 1995. But that's not what it said on his ID. And his last name that he told me, Andrews, was also wrong. It was not the same as the one on his ID. Needless to say, I was done. Very done. I told him to take the shirt he had given me when we had went swimming and to leave. He got pissed, threw the shirt away and swore up and down that it would change, that it would never happen again. I didn't believe him, not from the look in his eyes. I know that look, and it's not what I was going to trust. He tried to follow me inside and smack me on the ass as I was going inside but because I was in the middle of cooking when he showed up, I had a hot spatula waiting on the stove for him. I told my mom that if he ever showed up again to shoot him. My family doesn't play like that. I told him my parents were on their way home, and that he needed to leave now. He asked if he needed to go, and I said yes, so he got in his car and said goodbye and left immediately. That part is fairly normal, I guess. But what really freaked me out is what I found after he left. I googled the name that I saw on his ID, and what I found was beyond disturbing. Apparently he had kept a woman who he was in a relationship prisoner for basically three months while he beat the crap out of her. She refused to get a tattoo of his name, so instead he carved his initials into her back. What I read in the police report honestly made me start crying. He was a horrible person. I'm still scared because I don't know if he has people out there looking for me, or my ex or his sister, but what scares me the most is that I could have been next. This was about three years ago on a dark stretch of road, near a main intersection in a major Bay Area city. I worked at a big name healthy grocery store from 2014 to 2017. I was lucky to meet and work with amazing co-workers, some of whom have become my best and closest friends. One of my best friends, at the time and to this day, Cav, is one of the nicest and most caring people I've ever met. He's incredibly generous, genuine and warm and welcoming to everyone, sometimes to a fault. At the time of this story, I was a woman in my early 20s, and Cav was a guy in his late 20s. Cav and I had a weekly ritual of driving around the city after work and talking, sometimes about our problems, sometimes about what was going well, but it was therapeutic and only something to look forward to. This particular night, we invited our buddy Ben to join us. His department always got out 30 to 45 minutes after the rest of the store. So Cav and I decided we would do a short drive around the area to pass the time until Ben was off. Cav was driving that night. We did our drive and are now headed back to the store to pick up Ben. In order to get back to the store, we need to take a U-turn at a four-way intersection. To get to the intersection, we have to go down a dark but short stretch of road. There are no streetlights for some reason. The intersection is well lit always busy and has a shopping center plaza on each side. From the dark stretch of road, it's precisely 302 feet, according to Google Maps, to the main well-lit and ever-busy intersection. As we're driving down the dark section, Cav suddenly interrupts what I was saying and says, Oh my god, did you see that person waving? He slows down the car as I look back. No. What are you talking about? You didn't see them? There was someone in a black hoodie waving us down. I'm looking back. I have poor eyesight, and it's dark. No, I don't see anyone. There's no one there. As I'm saying this, Cav is pulling into the empty parking lot parallel to the dark stretch of road. 
He reaches to the back seat and is moving jackets and other things off the seat, obviously making room for this person. No, Cav, I said. No one's getting into this car, do you understand? But what if they need... No, there's no one there, and if they were, they could walk up to the fucking intersection. No. He agrees, but insists we circle around and check. I reluctantly agree when I realize I have no choice anyway. But we circle back, and sure enough, there's a girl my age, in her early 20s, standing alone and wearing all black. She has a hoodie on. She looks disheveled and is sort of crying. Maybe. The cab rolls down the passenger window, my window, down about halfway, to which I roll it back up another quarter and asks her if she's okay. Something about her seems off, and I immediately have awful vibes coming from her. Four guys stole my purse, she says with her hands over her face. It had my wallet. I literally lost everything and I don't have a phone. The weirdest thing about this is that she wasn't crying. She was stretching her words out and whining, but she wasn't crying. Okay, we'll call the police for you. Why don't you walk up to the well-lit plaza at the main intersection and we'll wait with you for police. No, she says adamantly. It won't help. I already called the police an hour ago. This is when I start to get weirded out. She just said she didn't have a phone. She's been standing in the dark for an hour? I thought you don't have a phone, I said. I do, but it's dead. All of this is happening rapid fire, and before I can really mentally get into what's going on, Cav tells her to get into the car so we can help her. I say, walk up to the intersection and we'll help you. Calva locks the doors and says, No, don't worry, we'll drive you there. The girl has her hands in the front pocket of her hoodie and gets into the car. I'm pissed, fuming. This girl is acting weird. I remember at this point that I have my box cutter on me. I reach down in my backpack and I'm rummaging through my crap to find it. Cav is talking to her, but everything she says is contradictory. She says she isn't from this area, has no idea where she is, yet she tells us that she grew up and lives around six blocks away. As we're driving, she says she wants to go to a particular bar, and that she could really use a drink. I thought you didn't have your wallet or ID, I ask. I keep looking for my box cutter, and I'm looking back at her. She has a waxy complexion and looks into my eyes as if she's looking right through me. It gives me the creeps. Cav is incredibly kind to her, an idiot, and keeps saying positive things trying to get to the bottom of what's going on. While this is happening, I find my box cutter, open it all the way and hold it in my lap. I turn back to keep my eyes on her. She tells us she has a boyfriend nearby and asks us to take her there. She and Cav continue to talk and she says she was kicked out of her parents' house. Her hands still remain in her pocket, and mine is holding the box cutter. Because of this whole ordeal, we've totally forgotten about Ben. Still watching her, I pull up my phone and call him. I'm explaining to Ben what's happening, and in a matter of seconds, she went from asking us for money and alcohol to saying weird shit like just wanting to get out of the car. We did not drop her at her boyfriend's house but a few streets away, apparently, in the middle of a random neighborhood. We drop her off, and there's silence for a few seconds in the car. Oh my god, Cav says laughing. She could have robbed us or killed us. Yeah, you fucking idiot. I'm 100% certain that at the very least, she was planning to rob us. Looking back, there's so much I would have done differently, like calling the cops right away. We were lucky nothing happened but I'm positive that there was evil in that car that night.